John Hook's Newsmaker Saturday starts now. Thanks for joining us on Newsmaker Saturday. State Superintendent of Public Instruction is one of the most important offices in this state. It oversees Arizona's public school system, directs the state's education department, 1.1 million students, 60,000 teachers. Kathy Hoffman is the current superintendent running for re-election against former state school superintendent Tom Horn. We will speak with Mr. Horn later on in the program, but let's begin with Kathy Hoffman, a former preschool teacher, speech pathologist, elected in 2018, running for a second term. Great to see you. Thank you for having Thank me, you for John. Being here. Um, I, I really want to start with where we are in test scores because we took a hit, obviously, during the pandemic. 41% of students in Arizona taking the, the assessment passed English, 41%, less than half. 33% passed math. What is going on? Well, we clearly have our cut work out for us, or we're cut out for us. Um, and Arizona is following trends like the, the rest of the country that the pandemic had a significant impact, a very negative impact on student learning. What, one of the biggest lessons we learned is that nothing replaces in-person learning and all the wraparound supports that our schools offer. I'm very grateful that through investment from the federal government and the COVID relief funding, we have been able to accelerate student learning. So in Arizona, from last spring in 21 to this year in 22, we actually did see growth. We saw a 2% increase in math and a 3% increase so in them back reading in and writing. So getting school was yes. really key. That's key. And hiring more staff, like the interventionists, having more supports, and, and really being intentional about making sure our students have everything they need to be successful. Why do Black and Latino and Native American students continue to lag behind? I think part of it is that just the historical nature of that, but we saw that the pandemic exacerbated those issues. We actually saw that they are now further behind, which is devastating. I think a huge part of that, especially in Arizona, knowing Navajo Nation was hit the, really, right. really hard the, at, during, especially the beginning of the pandemic. Yes. And so we have been working very strategically to make sure during the pandemic, we were even working in collaboration with organizations that were mailing food to kids in Navajo Nation, because even just this, this simple, uh, important part of school of getting breakfast and lunch at schools was not available getting to kids to during that time, exactly. And then thinking about the healthcare, uh, our, our Latino families also tragically lost more lives than, than our white counterparts. And so knowing that just the public health issues have impacted communities of color. Uh, there is a growing push to lower or eliminate testing requirements based on equity. Do you favor that? You know, there's the assumption that black and Latino students test lower than white and Asian students. Do you believe that there is a place to lower standards on testing? I do not. For students of color. I do not. Arizona has rigorous academic standards that are set by our local teachers here in Arizona. I think that it's really important that all of our students are being assessed. That are, you know, when we talk about the reading test, for example, and mm -hmm. when we we're just talking about how many kids can read, it is not sim a simple reading fluency test. It's making sure that kids are comprehending, mm -hmm. that they can compare and contrast, that they can write about what they're reading. So it's more in depth, and I think that all kids should be held to that standard. We talked about the pandemic. So March of 2020, early stages of the pandemic, you and Governor Ducey both said we're going to close schools. Then later announced a two-week extension of that, but this ended up becoming a year. Is it too long in retrospect? What would you have done differently now, knowing what you know now? And pe you know, some people have called this the most damaging series of events to befall public education in Arizona and the nation. Do you agree with that? I, I do in the regards that this was the biggest, most unprecedented setback for our kids and this generation of kids in so many regards. Our, our youngest learners, um, our enrollment numbers declined significantly during the pandemic, so there were a lot of has kids. Has it come back, by the way? It has bounced back. We're now where kids are back in school, thankfully. And I, so back in the spring of 2020, there were still so many unknowns about this illness that was killing people. And so my, our prior, my priority, along with Governor Ducey, was protecting the lives of Arizonans. And ultimately, Arizona had more deaths from COVID than any, that was second, sorry, second highest number of deaths from COVID in the country, second highest state in terms of the number of 
lost lives in the country. So you I, and the governor mm -hmm. kind of split, in, you know, as this went on, he's like, we're going to get kids back to school. You resisted. At that time, I was pointing to the data. And so I, CDC I did not. CDC data. And, and our local Department of Health Services mm -hmm. data that was tracking by our counties, tracking by school districts, where we could see the, the, the tracking the data. And, and I never, and I, at that point, I was not saying keep the whole state, um, keep all schools closed. I was saying let's use the data at the local level. And so where we had areas of high transmission, I was encouraging our local school leaders to be meeting with the county health officials and making a decision based on what's, what was best for them. So one quick example, I was just in Benson two, day, two days ago, and they reopened very quickly. And the superintendent shared with me, he said that was one of the most challenging decisions I've ever had to make as a superintendent um, to reopen so much earlier than other districts across the state. But he said, that's what my families and our community asked for. But then you have other districts like um, in Hayden Winkleman rural district where they lost one of their first grade teachers and it was devastating to their community to have a beloved you know, important member of their community who died from COVID. So that really has a ripple effect on the morale yeah. of all the teachers to come to be back to in person. Let's talk about teacher shortage for a minute. And this, this is interesting to me, 2,600 teachers needed roughly in Arizona. Mm -hmm. And I kind of thought this is our own problem. This is a, but it's not unique as I found out as I've researched this. Mm -hmm. California, which pays some of the best salaries for teachers, New York State, same, pays some of the best, they have the same problem. Mm -hmm. They're lacking about one out of five teachers are out. Mm -hmm. So is this a pay problem or a job satisfaction problem or a support from administration problem or even just a mobility problem? People are moving in all kinds of fields to other jobs. The teacher shortage is not a new issue in Arizona, and we do have among the lowest pay for teachers in the country. So I do think that we need to address the pay issue so that we're not losing our most experienced, most effective teachers, especially losing them to other states. We want to make sure Arizona stays competitive because ultimately what parents like myself want is making sure we have a really highly effective teacher in every classroom for our kids. I do think that there there sometimes is uh, a morale, um, some morale challenges around the workload that our teachers are facing. With having a teacher shortage, we've had increased classroom sizes. Mm -hmm. uh, we've had teachers paying for materials out of their own pocket. So I do think we need to be addressing some of the other factors there, but also asking the question, how are we inspiring the next generation of teachers? When we talk to kids and we say, what do you want to be when you grow up? It's not that often that they're saying teachers anymore. So what are we doing? Maybe we're to... asking too much of teachers. I would agree with that. Yeah. Maybe we are. Maybe we need to look at what's most effective and what can we take off their plate. We now have in Arizona one of the nation's most expansive voucher programs, school voucher programs. Uh, 1.2 million school aged children now can get 90% of their state money to go to the school of their choice. Governor Ducey calls it. We're going to be a state that puts children and parents first every day. Do you worry that this expansion is going to rob money from needed for public schools, the traditional public school? My biggest concern about universal expansion is that we are seeing that the families applying under universal expansion, that almost all of them, over 75%, are already enrolled in a private school. So we're, we're not seeing a, an exodus from public education. My concern is we're not asking the questions around how are we holding these schools accountable for the education they're delivering to children in the ESA voucher program. So while we're asking our public schools, districts and charters to show us how are your, are your kids reading? Are your kids doing well in math? And we, we collect that data and we're, we're ensuring that their teachers are certified. We're really having these high standards for public schools, but for private schools that are receiving our public tax funds, our education funds, they are not required to do state assessments. So we literally have no idea if they're teaching kids how to read. They're not required to serve all students. Do you believe in the choice students. of parents so to make that decision for their kids? I think parents should decide for their own kids which school is best for them. But 
I think parents also expect government to be holding schools accountable for the education being delivered. Mm -hmm. So for example, we had a parent reach out that their child was enrolled in a private school with the voucher and that school is not accredited. So when they went to transfer schools, their child's credits did not transfer. And so the, the, this family came to the Department of Education seeking help, but that's completely outside of our jurisdiction because we have no oversight over private schools. Let me ask you one more, um, and we've only got about 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. uh, S, or, um, Phoenix Unified High School District kicked armed police officers off their campus in the wake of George Floyd and the protests. Was that a wise move or not? So the number one priority for all Arizona parents and teachers is school safety. This is our, our number one concern, that all families should feel safe sending their kids to school. I was actually just visiting Phoenix Union High School District schools the other day, and I actually saw a police car with police officers at the, at the school, so I, I think there's still a, a strong partnership between security and our local police with our schools. I th and so I think what ultimately our, our schools, we need to have a comprehensive solution. These, these shootings are happening at our schools, they're happening. Do you think officers are a deterrent? Well, it's hard, when, there's, when we look at Uvalde, for example, they had the entire police force there and that didn't stop the shooter from murdering 19 children. So I think we need to think on both the side of prevention, but also working on school safety plans to ensure that when there is an active shooter, that everyone knows exactly what they need to do to keep everyone safe. Kathy Hoffman, uh, Superintendent of Public Instruction. Good to have you on the program. Thank you again. When we come back, uh, Tom Horn, the challenger, We'll spend some time with Mr. Horn, and we'll be back in a moment on Newsmaker Saturday. Thank you. Tom Horn held this job from 2003 through 2011. He was a state attorney general from 2011 to 2015, served two terms in the Arizona legislature before that. Mr. Horn joins me. He is a Republican nominee for state superintendent of public instruction. Good to see you. Good to see you, John. Thank you. And you left out my 24 years on the school board for Arizona's third largest district. <laughs> there you go. Okay, first of all, why do you want the job again? I mean, it's, you've been there, done that. You did two terms. Yes. What's uh, left to accomplish? Well, it's not only that, but my friends tell me after being attorney general, I'm going backwards. But my response to that is uh, the big problems in the schools, and that's really what I want to work on. Big problems. Big Let's problems. start with test scores. Yes. This is post-COVID, I understand, yeah. but Arizona's recent test scores, 41% of students uh, in the assessment passed English, 41%. 33% passed math. That is abysmal by any standard. What's going on? Well, first of all, well, it's, it's a failure, failure of leadership by the incumbent, and, uh, and that's what's motivating me to run. And um, when I left office, we, we were at 60% in math and 74% in reading. So, uh, and then I use the pre-COVID numbers because I don't want to blame her for COVID, but even pre-COVID, her numbers were 42% and 42%. So 60% to 42% in math, 74% to 42% in reading pre-COVID. So what would be causing this? I mean, you're, you're talking about most of this stuff is done on the local level. We believe in local control. The superintendent is determining test score fall? Yes, because uh, when I was superintendent, my focus was on academics. And I can tell you uh, uh, things that I did as superintendent to increase academics that the current superintendent is not doing. Uh, she's distracted with other things. Uh, so um, critical race theory, uh, uh, social emotional learning, uh, things that tend to sexualize our children, which I think shocks the people the most. But she's focused on those things, not on academics. I've never seen a story in the newspaper where she's saying what she's going to do to raise academics. She had a column arguing that biological boys should be able to compete in girls' sports. Uh, there was a story about her demanding that we close all the schools statewide when the governor wanted to leave it up to local decisions and local... During COVID. During COVID, yeah. yeah. Why are black, Latino, and Ameri Native American students lagging even further? Well, they shouldn't. Uh, um, you know, Thomas Sowell is one of my favorite writers. He's a, a, a famous black conservative uh, who unearthed a lot of evidence that there are, there are schools, and he wrote about the schools, where blacks and Latinos do just as well as whites. Um, maybe not quite as well, whites don't do quite as well as Asians. But um, uh, we have to focus on making sure 
that our schools have high expectations for students regardless of their race or anything else about them. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and then they can, they can do the same. Let's talk about the teacher shortage. I think we're short about 2,600 teachers in Arizona. Um, this is not unique to Arizona. We seem to think that Arizona is some outlier. This is happening all over the country. Is this a pay issue, an administrative support issue? What's going on? Why are we having so much trouble retain, te attracting and retaining teachers? Yes, when teachers leave the profession, they're surveyed. And the number one reason they give for leaving is not salaries, this is a surprise to a lot of people. It's the failure to get administrative support, especially on discipline. Um, I believe very strongly in disciplined classrooms where kids can learn. And, and uh, during my 24 years on a school board, we didn't reverse a teacher one time on an issue of discipline. We were known as the toughest district around. Our learning went up and our test scores went up. Under Kathy Hoffman, uh, social emotional learning, they tell the teachers don't discipline the kids because it hurts their feelings. Uh, and this, I think this is a significant factor in the low test scores because kids cannot learn if, if you, you don't have disciplined classrooms. If a, if, I've heard from teachers who say a student swore at me and, and I called the, district, the office to do something about it and they wouldn't do anything about it. They said use your social emotional learning. Well that doesn't do any good when you've got a kid that's willing to swear at you. And then the other kids see that one kid gets away with it and you get the problem where teachers feel like, I can't take it anymore, I have to leave, and I, I would leave under those circumstances. Let's talk about teacher pay. Yes. Um, teacher salaries in Arizona, $52,157. That's the average for the 2021 school year. It rose $1,300. Uh, compared to other states, it's a 2.7% salary increase in Arizona. We were the 11th largest. We've tried to kind of address this is it not enough? No. <clears throat> what happened was uh, the governor promised a 20% raise to teachers, but the legislation was badly written, so the school boards were able to use the money for other things. So teachers generally got a raise, but they didn't get the 20% they were promised. And I think one of the jobs of the superintendent is to look at legislation that affects education and demand corrections where Can't there are... Can't the school boards dig in and stop <clears throat> this? If, if administrative waste is where this money's going. Mm -hmm. And I keep hearing this. Yes. Can't the school boards put an end to it? Well, the, the superintendent has influence on it also. Um, and, and I think, I'll tell you one thing is, there's a lot of conservatives running for school boards that, that d didn't used to. A lot of school boards were dominated by, li dominated by liberals. Um, so there's gonna, there's gonna be a big change, I think, in the tenor of school boards, but they've got to have the support from the top. That's why I'm running for this office. Uh, it, you have to create an overall atmosphere uh, in this case of, of making sure the money goes in teacher salaries and not administration. I've been, I've been crusading against uh, excessive administration for at least 20 years now. Uh, the money has to go to the salaries of teachers because we lose good teachers to surrounding states that have higher, um, higher salaries. And no school can be better than the quality of the teachers inside the classroom. What's a single you talk about? You've talked about test scores and that that was kind of job one when you were there. Yes. What would be the single thing that would improve test scores, do you think, in Arizona? Well, I'm going to give you three things, if that's okay. Okay, that's fine. <clears throat> Number one, the, the Department of Education has to be a service organization. Uh, that was my emphasis. So we had school improvement teams that went out to help the schools that were having trouble. Uh, currently, they don't have that. Uh, the, the school improvement is what schools have described to me as paperwork hell, where they get long questionnaires, they have to fill them out. Some bureaucrat says, there are problems with it, so it goes back and forth. By the time they get the school improvement money, it's almost too late to do anything with it. So that's number one. We have to, we have to be a service or organization. We have to help the schools not cause more trouble for them with the success of regulation. <clears throat> number two, we have to hold our districts accountable for low test scores. Um, I would schedule a hearing with districts that had low test scores, for example, Roosevelt, uh, and, uh, and, and the result of the hearing could be that the state would take over the district. That got their attention and the test scores came up. The current administration is not doing that. The third thing is, there are three things that are important for education. The quality of the teachers and teacher leaders, the quality of curriculum, and the motivation of the students. And a lot of times people forget about the motivation of the students. So I had a, such, a system whereby students had to pass the statewide test to graduate, and that was a great motivator for them. 
uh, that's not there now either. And so, so if I were elected, so kids get moved on whether they're ready or not. Yeah, the social the uh, social promotion is a huge problem. I've talked to high school teachers who said they get kids from middle school that failed every single class in seventh and eighth grade, and they still got passed on to high school. We've got to put a stop to that. You talked about um, kind of holding districts' feet to the fire. One of the things is competition. Vouchers have certainly. Uh, charter schools, we've been kind of ground zero for charter schools yeah. uh, here in Arizona. So the legislature expanded vouchers so that these education dollars can follow kids. 7000 bucks each year to use for private school, uh, homeschooling even, tutors, any educational improvement. They can opt out of public school if they want to and do something different. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's a good idea or are we robbing from the public school money pot and thereby kind of undermining what we're trying to do here. There's a lot there. Competition makes everybody better. Um, I was a champion of charter schools when I was served on my, uh, in the legislature. Uh, I, I, as a chairman of a conference committee, I killed a bill that would have limited the growth of charter schools. As a result, when I left office, Arizona was number one in the entire nation. We had 10% of our kids in charter schools. Number two was Florida at 7%, and everybody enjoys that when Florida's number two, because they're always held up as number one. Mm -hmm. um, and my experience as a school board member was, for, I'll give you an example, when we negotiated with the teachers, they would say eliminate advanced placement classes that don't have enough kids in them, because not enough qualified, that's inefficient, use that money for teacher salaries. And I would say if you do that, you lose your best kids to the charter schools, and that would end the discussion. We wouldn't have to talk about that anymore. So competition causes everybody to perform better. That's why the United States is prosperous and the Soviet Union was poor. Do you worry, though, that the dollars, it seems that 70% that are people already enrolled in these kinds of options, right. that you're kind of patting the pockets of wealthy folks who are just going to right. um, either a religious school or a charter private school, school, private school. Private school. Yeah. Do you worry that, that those are the people who are going to benefit and not the lower income folks who may want options? Yes, I, I, um, I get to ask this question a lot, and my answer is, the important question is not the gross amount of money going to school, it's the amount of money per pupil. Right. So if a pupil decides to go someplace else, uh, they lose the funding for that pupil, but they'll lose the expense of, of teaching them. that pupil. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. So, so if you look at dollars per pupil, it does not have a negative effect. Is CRT being taught in Arizona schools, critical race theory. I keep hearing that it's not. Yeah. Other people say, oh no, it is. I can prove beyond any doubt that it is. I have a list of 200 teachers, Arizona teachers, that when they were the National Teachers Union, they signed a statement that was promoted by the National Teachers Union that if the state prohibited critical race theory, they would defy it. They wouldn't sign that unless they were already teaching it. And I know that 25 school districts they came to from all the biggest school districts are on that list. So it's being taught very widely in Arizona, and I'm determined to put a stop it's to it. It's being taught, but not under the, under the name CRT. It's being taught in other ways? Is that what uh, you're telling Well, me? both. It's being taught sometimes under critical race theory, sometimes under social emotional learning. In Chandler, it's deep equity. In Peoria, it's power diversity. But it's, it's critical race theory, and these teachers are teaching it, and we need to put a stop to it because this has to be education and not indoctrination. One more, and we'll have to be quick on this. Yeah. Phoenix Unified removed police officers from their schools in the wake of George Floyd. Concerns with BLM protests about police being oppressors on a campus. What do you think of that? I think that's outrageous as heck, and, and we're going to put a stop to it. We need to, have teacher, we need to have policemen in our schools because if some maniac attacks the school, there has to be somebody there to defend the kids. If you say, as some of the liberals say, we want to have gun-free schools, what you're really saying is, I'm a victim, come get me. There's nothing to protect me. I've been an advocate uh, all of my public life. To have, we need to have a policeman in every school. They're called school resource officers. They're there all the time. And they become friendly with the kids. So the kids learn to trust them rather than viewing them as enemies. Um, so that's, that's a big issue for me. And we need, to, we need to make sure that every school in our state has a police officer so we don't have what happened in Texas. If it happened in Texas, it could happen in Arizona. And if it happens before I have a chance to put a policeman in every school, it's going to be an unbelievable tragedy. Tom Horn, candidate, Republican candidate for superintendent of public instruction in Arizona. Thank you. Appreciate Thank you, John. I appreciate it. I'll come back anytime you want me. You got it. You got a deal. Thank you. Tom Horn, we're back in a minute on Newsmaker Saturday. That's it for us this week. We will see you next week on Newsmaker Saturday.